Hello everyone. Welcome to part five of the academic research series. So in the previous tutorial, we have talked about how you can write a research paper. So after you are done with writing a research paper, now you need to select some journal, some scientific journal to publish your research paper into. So this tutorial is about how you can select the right journal for your paper. So let's dive deep into it. So the first thing is we need to know the difference between a journal and a publisher. So each academic publisher can have many different journals from diverse areas. I will give you a few examples. For example, you have the Oxford publisher and in that publisher, we have the nucleic acid research journal, which deals with molecular biology research. We have bioinformatics journal that deals with computer science and bioinformatics research. And we have the brain journal that deals with neuroscience. Let's take another example. We have the Elsevier publisher, which deals with different areas such as healthcare, AI, environmental engineering, and they belong to different journals such as Lancet, Parent Cognition, and Renewable Energy. Now, if you want to actually search this particular journal, Bioinformatics, you need to write in Google Bioinformatics from Oxford Publisher, and that's it. And you will get the right journal website. Okay. Now, is the journal interested in your work? That is something you need to know before even submitting or else it will just be rejected. So let's see. So if you want, want to know what things are the journal interested in, the first thing you should do, you should go to the journal website, then navigate to the submission site, and then go to the other guidelines section. In this other guidelines section, they actually give the scope of the journal and what kind of work they're interested in. Another way you can do this is you can just navigate to the section with recently published papers. And looking at these papers will also give you some idea about what they actually want in recent years. You also have a something, someone I should say, called journal editor who handles all publications. So in the contact information section of the journal, you are going to find some email address of the journal editor. You can just send him your extract of the paper, the summary of the paper, and you can ask him whether they are interested in your paper or not. And finally, some publishers such as LCR provide you with journal finder tools. So in these tools, you can write your keywords, you can write the abstract, and you can directly search for relevant journals. But not all publishers have this tool. Now that you know which journals are actually interested in your paper, you now need to know which journals you are interested in. And that you can decide based on the impact of the journal. So we want to publish our papers ideally in highly impactful journals. So how do we know if a journal is impactful or not? Let's talk a bit about citation first. So if you have published a paper and 10 other works referenced or cited your published work, then the citation count for your paper will be 10. So there are some papers with thousands of citations. That means thousands of works actually benefited from that work and referenced that work in their research. That is why that's a highly impactful paper. Similarly, highly impactful journals have a lot of citations in their published papers. So first of all, the most vanilla metric which people use and everybody knows about this is the impact factor. It's a very simple metric. If a journal has published 10 research papers in these two years, 23, 24, and the total number of citations received is 100, I should also mention that this citation should be in year 2025, okay? So you should look at the publications happening in the last two years and the citation count should be from the year, from the current year basically, 2025 is the current year when I'm making the video. Then the impact factor of this journal for the year 2025 is 100 divided by 10 is equal to 10. That means average citation made in the current year for the last two year publications is 10. 10 is a big impact factor by the way. So anything above four or five is actually quite good in terms of impact factor. Then let's go to site score, which is, I would say, more stable because site score is calculated in a wider span of years. So if a journal has published 100 research papers in maybe 2021, 2024, and the total number of citations received is 2000, then site score is going to be 2000 divided by 100 is equal to 10, is equal to 20, I'm sorry, not 10. So it is actually in a much wider span. So while impact factor is based on more recent impact, side score is based on more overall impact in four years, I would say. Okay, 
Now that we know what side score is, let's now move on to age index. If a journal has 50 research papers with at least 50 citations, then age index is 50. So you can imagine that if a journal has an age index of 1000, then the journal has 1000 papers with at least 1000 citations, which is quite a big deal. Then we have the modern HR score or the Saimago journal rank score. So Saimago is basically a website that gives different metrics of a journal. I will show you this website a, bit, a little bit later on uh, with, in an example. So let me explain what this is. Suppose journal A has published 50 papers from 22 to 24. So again, this is a three-year span, by the way. This is a three-year span. This is very important. These papers received total 500 citations in year 2025. That means the recent year, the current year. And 200 of these citations, so 200 out of these 500 citations come from journals with SGR score of 0.5 and the rest 300 come from journals with SGR score of 2. In that case, the score will be 200 into 0.5 plus 300 into 2 divided by 50. So this is sort of a weighted impact within three years. I will repeat this again. In three years, total 50 papers were published and on 2025, the current year, total 500 citations were obtained. 200 citations was from a lower SGR score journal paper, papers, I should say, and the SGR score was 0.5. So we are actually weighing it by 0.5, the 200. And the rest 300 were from much higher SGR score journal papers. Maybe the score was 2. So then this will be 300 into 2. And then you have total 50 papers, so divided by 50. So the SGR score here is 14. Right. So any SGR score above 2 is actually very high. And SGR scores from 0.5 to 2 is moderate and below 0.5 is normally low. So that is all about SGR score. Now another thing SGR score takes into account is self-citation. That means if you yourself are citing your own works, then SGR score, I mean, doesn't account for that that much. So it sort of, demon, I mean, demonizes you. It sort of like, what should I say, underscores your HR score a bit. Okay. The final thing you need to know is the journal quartile. So there are Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 journals. Suppose there are total 100 journals in a particular field of research. Then the top 25 journals, according to HR score, will fall in Q1 category, and the last 25 will fall in Q4. So Q1 is the highest quality and Q4 is the lowest quality. Ideally, you should try to publish your papers in Q1 journals, but okay, I mean, if you cannot, then you can go to lower categories as well. So those are all about journal impacts, and I will show you exact examples uh, using two separate journals that are on. So next is journal access. So what is journal access? So if you publish your paper in a journal, then who can access that paper? That is called journal access. So there are journals which are open access. What it means is, you will need to pay an APC charge, an article processing charge during publication. And that charge can be huge as well. I mean, for some journals, it is like 5,000 US dollars. You need to see what kind of charge they're applying by looking at the website. And sometimes if you have some economic issue, you can even apply to the editor to waive some APC charges. Now, the thing is, if you pay this APC charge during publication, people all over the world can then read the paper freely. So they can go to the website, they can download your paper and read it freely. Then there is the closed access journal. You can imagine what this is. You don't need to make any payment here and people around the world can only read your paper if they pay subscription fee to the journal or their institution has subscribed to the journal. That's the thing. And finally, you have hybrid access. So here you can either choose to make your article open access or you can choose to make your article closed access. So if you choose to make your article open access, that means if you want everyone to have access to your article, then you need to pay APC. And if you choose not to pay APC, then your article will be closed access. That is all about journal accessibility. So if you are planning to pay the APC, you need to contact your supervisor or your institution even before submitting, because you need to make sure that the institution or the supervisor will pay for the APC. Okay, because this is something you will not need to pay from your pocket. Okay, next is journal indexing. So you are often going to hear things like Scopus Index Journal, Web of Science Index Journal, etc. So what does that mean? So let's talk about Scopus Index first. 
So it is probably the largest citation database currently for journals. A journal is only included in this indexing if it meets certain standards set up by the Scopus. And if, if a journal is cited or indexed in Scopus, then it is highly credible and you can submit your article there. Then we have PubMed or Medline indexing. It is also reputable, but it is reputable for high quality life science and biomedical papers, not computer science or other fields. And then we have Web of Science indexing. It is also a high quality index, but it is for science and social science papers. I would suggest you to look for one of these three indexings. Normally, I mean, people look at Scopus and PubMed or Medline. So if you have a Scopus index, then you can be sure that this is a legit journal. If you have PubMed or Medline indexing, it's still okay. I mean, most PubMed or Medline indexed papers also have Scopus index. And Web of Science, I would say it's okay, it's borderline. But if you don't have any one of these three indexing a journal, then I would recommend you not to submit there, just to be safe. Okay. And finally, archiving your paper. So let me explain this first. And I am now inside Google. And if I search archive, you can see that you have this archive.org. You can submit your paper here. You can upload your source file, you can submit the paper, and they will do some screening and they will publish the paper in the archive. You should archive your paper even before submitting to a journal. This is because when you archive your paper, it is now your own intellectual property and no one else can claim it. So you have now right on this intellectual property. Another thing is, suppose you have chosen closed access. That means you haven't paid any APC to the journal. Obviously, people cannot access your article. But if you have archived your paper also, then people can access your article through the archived version. They cannot access the published official version, but they can access the archived version. And all journals allow this. And also there is another kind of archive. So normal archive.org is for general purpose. It's for all different uh, domains and fields. But if you are doing medical research or biomedical research or bioinformatics or computational biology, then you should archive in bioarchive. Okay, bioarchive.org. I will give you an example. For example, this work right here, I will go here first. So you can see that this is published in National Biomedical Engineering, but I have not paid the APC here. So I have to, in order to read this from this website, I will have to buy or subscribe. Okay, but <laughs> there is a but here. So I have also bioarchived this paper. So I can click here. So you can see that you can also read this entire paper from bioarchive. Okay. So this is the beauty of bioarchiving. So actually people can read your paper, but it's just not the official version. It's the unofficial version. That's the only difference. And sometimes there will be a few works which you couldn't publish anywhere, or maybe you didn't have the time to publish. You can also archive those so that other people can read those papers. For example, I have this paper of grammatical errors. And it was never published, but there is an archive version of this paper available. Okay. Okay. So I think we have an understanding about archiving, bioarchiving right now. So, I mean, bioarchive is similar to archiving. You have to submit the work, submit the PDF and other things, and they will give you, they will do some screening and they will probably publish it. So, I, I mean, it's not like complicated or robust quality control is not actually taken care of there. It's just like a database. So you have the it's intellectual property and you have it open now so that other people cannot just steal it from you. Okay, so we have actually talked a lot about different journal rankings. So I want to show you a few things. For example, let's see the Oxford Bioinformatics Saimago ranking. So if you search this, you will see this particular website in Saimago for Bioinformatics Journal. So Saimago, I think this is the most comprehensive view you are going to get for a journal. So and, and a very easy one. So I'm going to show you it here. So you can see it has an SGR score of 2.45, which is very good. Then H index of 486, that means it has 486 papers with at least 486 citations, which is quite good. It's a Q1 journal which is again quite good. It's a high quality quarter one journal. You can also look at its impact factor. If, you, if I go down, you can see that this deep blue line for the last two years, this is the impact factor. So you can see that it has an impact factor of around five. I mean, it's fluctuating, but it's around, around like four to six all the time, right? So yeah, that is all about the Saibago. I can give you another example. For example, this is a journal of bioinformatics and computational biology. It has a much lower HR score. It's from Q4, 
and it has a much lower age index as well. And you can also look at the citation. So it has around like 0.7 or I mean, it has around 0.8 to 1.2 impact factor normally. Okay. You can also look at the journal website. For example, this is the website for bioinformatics. You can just search this up. So here you are also going to see things like impact factor, site score, etc. And you can also see that it's a scopus indexed. And same goes for this journal. So you can see these scores right here. Now, very, very important for you to understand is sometimes a journal doesn't actually show the indexing, whether it is Scopus index or web of science index, etc. It doesn't show. You will have to navigate a lot. The easiest way is just ask ChatGPT. Just ask ChatGPT and uh, tell it to provide you the website link where this is mentioned about the journal. So it will provide you with that link and it, you can easily verify whether the journal is Scopus indexed or not. Okay. So I hope that through this video, you have a very good idea about how you can select your journal for publication. So in the next video, I am going to talk about how you can exactly you can submit your paper and what does peer review process mean. So the link will be in the description. And also there is a link for donation in the description. You can send donation to my channel in order to support the work we are doing, the contents we are making for you. And finally, if you like the video, make sure to subscribe, make sure to share the video with your friends. Thanks very much.